Welcome to the Digital Planning Podcast. This series is designed to educate individuals about all things digital in connection with estate planning, business planning, and estate administration. To keep up with all things digital, please subscribe to iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you download your podcasts. And now, Jennifer Ziegel, a partner at Kleinbird LLC, Ross Bruck, a principal of Estate Genie, and Justin Brown, a partner at Troutman Pepper Hamilton Sanders LLP, with today's topic. Welcome back to the Digital Planning Podcast. I'm your host, Jen, and I'm with my co-hosts, Justin and Ross, and we are resuming our conversation with cybersecurity attorney Lisa Garber on the topic of online voting. This interview was recorded in June of 2020. 2020 has already been a historical year from the pandemic to bringing social injustice issues to the forefront of discussions through the Black Lives Matter movement. And it's only going to continue to unfold as a monumental year as election season kicks into high gear. Many citizens have decided to exercise their rights to vote through absentee ballots to protect their safety uh, through avoiding crowds at voting polls. And some states are taking other measures by authorizing the use of online voting. Lisa, could you describe a little bit about the online voting process in states that have authorized this? Definitely, and it's super interesting. In March of this year, I published an op-ed column for Newsweek entitled Coronavirus and In-Person Voting Don't Mix. We Must Prepare for Digitized Elections. That was back in March. Now we're at June, and many states are changing their positions on online voting, remote voting, and absentee ballots. So the legal issues surrounding these questions are constantly evolving. And I will tell you right now, a lot of it surrounds the idea of no excuse laws. So no excuse laws expand absentee voting to try to make the voting process more convenient for people without an accepted excuse. An accepted excuse is a disability, a time conflict like work or travel that's been planned during polling time. So right now the question is, can an excuse be your fear of coronavirus or potentially if you are sick or you're caring for a family member? About two thirds of the US have no excuse laws that allow and expand absentee voting. And PA actually is a recent addition to that list. Pennsylvania is a recent addition to the no excuse movement. So. One of the main ideas I address in my article is we want to get out the vote, no excuses, and let's make people the best able to cast their vote. But right now, in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, in the midst of unfolding social injustice issues, like you said, there are so many problems facing the our ability to vote. So when I think about the ability to cast your vote online. My first thought, and many other cybersecurity experts' first thought is, well, we basically do everything else online, so why are we not at this point already? And a really common response in addition to that is, well, we actually, we bank online, so what's more private than that? What requires more security and protection than that? Why can't we cast a vote already? And the real problem here is, Here and there, there are data breaches and problems with people accessing their online bank account, right? And you may even have a loss of money in your bank account due to some sort of internet connected issue, whether that's a hacker or a malfunction. But when we think about voting on the whole in the United States, one miscount or one lack of count equals a disaster. An election has to count everybody who votes. And not only that, but elections have to be anonymous. The voters have that right. And additionally, elections really, the results can't be changed. They're concrete versus other activities we do online. If you have an issue banking online, you can call the bank, try to get it resolved. That's not really an option for voting. Lisa, can you describe the differences between absentee ballots and online voting? Definitely. Absentee ballots simply mean that you are not in a polling location to to cast your vote. 
you're actually casting your vote from somewhere else. So you're doing it typically by actual regular postal mail. For many citizens, that actually means for military personnel or overseas voters like expats, they may be doing it through email or fax. And those kinds of absentee votes are permitted under federal government programs that facilitate that type of voting for our men and women in uniform and then also for expats as well. So that's gone on for years. Online voting is completely different in that you are actually casting your vote in an internet connected way. So that would look like many of the apps that we've seen in the news lately, like Vote, which is V-O-A-T-Z, and Omniballot. Those are examples of ways to cast your vote online, which right now is in really preliminary stages in the U.S. So there is some confusion around that, and they are inherently separate things. But at times, online voting can overlap with absentee voting if you're able to cast your vote online. Does that make sense? Yes. And where does mail-in voting fit in between those two worlds? Mail-in voting is absentee voting. So that's where the idea of the no excuse laws come in, where you're able to actually cast your vote without going to a polling place. So that's what it looks like when you get your official mail-in ballot in the mail, that's absentee voting. More recently though, mail-in voting has allowed you to do so without being out of your jurisdiction, if I'm not mistaken? That's actually what I was trying to get at with the no excuse laws. So basically, no excuse laws expand absentee voting. So generally when we think of absentee voting, you think of expats, you think of men and women in uniform, and you think of people with a disability. Now, those laws are expanding to include no excuse, which means it's just supposed to make the process more convenient for people who don't have, who don't fit into one of those three categories. And right now, that looks like people that are dealing with the coronavirus, that are worried about going to polling places, things like that. So the first time this online voting technology was utilized uh, was at the Iowa caucus this past winter. And it didn't really go so well. What what happened? The tech actually surrounding the idea of online voting has been in use before in pilot programs. So it's really state specific. And actually, Alaska had offered an online absentee ballot submission option back in 2018, but it suspended it. And that has happened in a couple other states as well. So many times these type of online voting measures are really just temporary pilot programs to see how it goes, see what the flaws are. But the Iowa caucus app really drew attention to the idea and the problem surrounding online voting because the Iowa caucus app was a disaster. It was a perfect storm. And the problem really was the rush to production. So the Iowa caucus centered around an app that would actually tally the caucus results. It wasn't any more complicated than that. They weren't giving ballots, they weren't taking ballots, it was just supposed to tally results. And what happened is the Iowa Democrats actually paid a private company $60,000 to develop this app. Again, it was only supposed to tally results, but the company was only given two months to create this app and they weren't allowed to open it up to outside testing. They didn't want independent security experts to review it. So it really was a closed process. And obviously it ended up in major problems. The app was riddled with coding issues. It had flaws in the way it was presented and it actually was opened up to potential breaches and hacker interceptions. So the real issue with this app that was just supposed to tally results was that more than 12 hours after the end of the caucus, results weren't ready. And this is the problem that we are very concerned about in the state primaries and in our election in the fall. With an app like this, this shadow app, in terms of what the Iowa caucus used, for the task of simply tallying votes, tallying and count to get it so wrong. And that's a problem that the cybersecurity 
the cybersecurity field has just been expounding upon in terms of the idea of online voting and whether we're ready, the consensus being we are not ready for online voting. Lisa, do you see um, the, the a, a shift to online voting being more federalized or on a state level? Um, because my understanding is that elections are governed on the state level, but how do you assure that everybody is doing everything in a safe manner if each state has an opportunity to do it their own way? When you look at the landscape of voting in the United States, it really differs on a local, state, and federal level. So every state actually goes about the process of counting votes in a polling place in a different way, whether that's the actual machines that are in place, at the polling center, whether it's the way they conduct their absentee voting, they use different mechanisms, they use different tech, they use different machines. And one of the major problems with many of these machines that different states use was uncovered in the major hacker conference in Vegas, DEF CON, which actually allowed hackers of all different skill levels to attempt to hack a voting machine. And they were very successful. So the problem is there's not enough money given to the states for these problems. There's not enough cybersecurity talent investigating these issues. And additionally, every state operates it a bit differently. Now, some cybersecurity experts look at that as a positive, because if everything's on the same system, just one flaw allows pandemonium, right? But if you have all these different setups, it also becomes more difficult to put in place guidelines for measuring security and for ensuring that the best practices are in place. So it's a very tricky scenario. I would say the federal response here is not positive in terms of online voting. And actually just last month in May, the FBI, the Election Assistance Commission, NIST and CISA issued an eight page report and they basically called electric ballot return high risk. The report doesn't actually say that states shouldn't implement electric ballot return or online voting because states are by law required to do so for, again, the expat community, for the military, and for people with disabilities. But on the whole, they're saying it is too high risk at this point. Lisa, is there anything that states should be doing to prevent the tech glitches that occurred at the Iowa caucus um, not impact uh, November's election? Definitely, Jen. I think the Iowa caucus app disaster is really illustrative and it's a teachable moment. So let's take from it what we can. They only gave this company two months. They didn't allow outside testers in and it wasn't proactively vetted enough. So I think states, in order to attempt to prevent tech glitches for whatever internet-based voting they're allowing, whether that's just the way that they actually mail out their ballots, whether it's allowing the accepted excuse voters to mail in, email, or fax their ballots, it's about being proactive. So that requires penetration testing, which is basically brute forcing a network to understand where the vulnerabilities are. It's allowing these kinds of applications and programs to be tested in the field. So continuing these pilot programs to see where they work and where they don't, and then test it some more. Really, the importance of testing cannot be overstated. But the other issue here is accountability. It's the problem that we're seeing in terms of voting right now on the whole, whether you talk about the potential issues with mail-in ballots or the potential issues with online voting, is a concern about voter trust. If voters aren't confident in the way they're casting their ballot and ensuring that their vote is counted, that's crucial. It's really what's the foundational element for elections on the whole. So we need to make sure that voters understand the implications of using these methods to cast their vote. Again, like I said before, one miscount or one no count means disaster for an election. So we need to understand how often and how state systems and computer-based components for their ballots are being tested and secured. 
we need to understand how they're being patched, how they're being revamped, how old technology is being replaced, and how the systems are being made better and more cutting edge. We have to feel confident that our votes will be counted. And what we saw with the Iowa Iowa caucus app disaster is the fact that we weren't even able to tally caucus results. It's very problematic. And I will say, really apropos of this conversation, I actually received an official mail-in ballot for a state election, and it was for someone else. It was mailed to me at my current address for someone who used to live here. And I've been researching like crazy to figure out what to do with this piece of mail to make sure it gets dealt with in the proper way. And there is no easy answer. And wow. that's just with a mail-in ballot. So it's, it's pretty terrifying. And when you think about the idea of online voting, I think it's important to understand that there are so many pieces of our voting process that are connected to a computer or connected to the internet regardless of whether you're casting your actual vote online. And just as an example, New Jersey recently had a software malfunction with their state division of elections statewide voter registration system. And it delayed the mailing of some military and overseas ballots for their primary. And then in Pennsylvania, uh, the first election the state has had where votes can be placed by mail Philly alone is apparently handling more mail ballot requests in this election than the entire state did in 2016. And they had an issue with their printer. The printer removed independent and third party voters who can't vote in this primary and accidentally rearranged the remaining voters and parties in the system and mixed them up. And it was a computer error. So for PA, which is a closed primary state, meaning only if you're registered Democrat can you vote in a Democratic primary and only if you're registered Republican can you vote in a Republican one, people got the wrong ballot. And it was it's still a frustrating process that's being rectified. But again, this is a computer problem. So it's not just the idea of online voting. Anything connected to a computer or the internet can be hacked if somebody tries hard enough and has the skills to do so. So that's really the issue here is Internet voting is definitely risky, but there are other pieces of the voting process that are already connected to computers that we need to also consider. So to take the idea that one missed count or one incorrect vote can spell disaster for an election, combined with the fact that every piece of the uh, of the election process has some security risk, has some um, potential for error, isn't the idea weighing access to voting and the ability to make it easier for people to vote on one side with security on the other side? And isn't it a balancing act? So, so the, the, the one miscount seems a bit extreme when, when the idea behind it is to give greater access to people who might not otherwise have a vote, thereby making the process more open to all. Is that balancing act what is the driving force between weighing technology and and maximizing security? There is definitely a balancing act, and that's a fantastic and important question. I would say there is the problem of who has access to the technology for online voting and who has access to make sure their technology is up to snuff. So, When you talk about security related to voting apps or voting programs to do to cast your ballot online, it's not just the security of that program or that app. It's also the security of the person's device through which they're accessing that app or that program. And that's something that academic researchers found with a couple of these current voting apps, which is even if the voting app is fine and there are no bugs, If somebody has malware on their computer or their smartphone through which they're accessing that program, that can be extremely problematic as well. So the question is, okay, well, who is actually patching their software? Who's buying the latest antivirus and anti-malware programs? And when you look at it that way, there is definitely a balancing problem. There's a socioeconomic balancing problem. 
But then when you look at going to the polls, there's a problem there. Who has the time to wait in the hours long lines that we've seen? Who has the attitude where they don't have to worry about their health to wait in those lines for hours at end? And these are the questions that we're constantly balancing. So sure, nothing's perfect, but an election is built in this country on the idea that everyone's vote must be counted. So going back to the voter trust issue for a second, um, and, I, and I recognize that this is stepping into a political minefield, so um, feel free to skirt it as best you can. Um, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm wondering for online voting, if there's any identification verification. Um, and, and, I, and I recognize that that's an issue because your issue, Lisa, ha you got the wrong ballot and yours wasn't even online. Or, you know, if, if I have a, a, a client who passes away and the executor receives the ballot on the table, how do we make sure the executor doesn't fill out the ballot for the for the individual? And that that's just the paper ballot. What what mechanisms or are there any mechanisms for identification in either a paper or an online setting? This is a okay. There's many layers to this question. I want to hit them. My first thought is, and Jen knows, I was the executor to two family estates last year. And I still had some of those issues spill into this year, 2020, and during the pandemic. And one of the problems I faced when trying to prove identity for issues related to the estate was that I didn't have access to a notary because all of those functions, all of the banks I usually access for that and other places were closed, were unavailable for notarizing the documents I needed to prove that I was the executor for the estate. And so I could send in as many copies of my driver's license as I wanted, but it wasn't enough. So that's something this pandemic has really brought to the forefront is how do you actually prove your identity if you can't do it in front of a notary? And for voting right now, in 31 states, voter signatures have to be verified. So this used to be performed by specialists in signature verification, but now with so many more people voting with mail-in ballots, there's a larger reliance on signature verification software. And then there's obviously fear that it can be exploited and, and problems with that. But in terms of actually verifying your identity online, there's many ways we do that in regular daily life, right? We have biometric identifiers for accessing our smartphones, our bank accounts, whether that's your thumbprint or a scan of your face or your retina. And then we also, some people have actual voice recognition for logging into their banking system through the phone. There are many ways you can verify your identity in a digitized context. But for voting, it gets a little bit trickier because if you are trying to get an absentee ballot or if you're trying to cast a vote online, what happens if you give up your driver's license and there's a breach? What happens if someone else has a picture of your driver's license? And this actually plays into the most recent debacle surrounding online voting, which is OmniBallot. So OmniBallot, which allows election admins to basically send ballots to what they call hard to reach voters, like people in the military, people living abroad, people with disabilities, those three categories I mentioned before, is also offering an online voting ballot option. But one of the huge problems with OmniBallot, in addition to the results of a security audit done by academic researchers, is that apparently OmniBallot has no privacy policy. So this major ballot service actually collects all this data on us, whether it's the confirmation of your voter ID, your signature, anything else that identifies you could arguably be sold to an advertiser. And that's something that different journalists are still checking into. But the idea that a program like OmniBallot would have no protection for all the data you're providing is frightening. And that's another issue on top of actually verifying your identity. It's that all the tools you use to verify your identity 
are things that you inherently hold as private that you wouldn't want breached. They have to be held secure. So there's really a duality to this prospect. What has the federal response been to online voting? So I mentioned in early May that there was this eight-page report by a couple of different major federal entities, including the FBI, including NIST, and the Election Assistance Commission, and CISA. And CISA is the lead federal agency responsible for national election security. And this report, in essence, said online ballot return is high risk whether that's actual online voting, whether it's voting by email or fax, it's high risk. And I'd love to offer a quote from the report, which is, while there are effective risk management controls to enable electronic ballot delivery and marking, we recommend paper ballot return as electronic ballot return technologies are high risk, even with controls in place. Notably, we assess that electronic delivery of ballots to voters for return by mail is less vulnerable to systemic disruption. And when you think about all of the problems we had in 2016 and the ideas of foreign actors trying to hack the election, there is a concern that a major election like the one taking place in the fall, we are not ready for it to be online. And it looks like we may not even be ready for it to be partially online in the way of how we distribute and collect absentee ballots. Now, CISA, again, the lead federal agency responsible for national election security, has a hashtag project out called hashtag protect 2020, and they call it a national call to action to enhance the integrity and resilience of the U.S. election infrastructure. What does that require? It means more money. It means more attention. It means a better perspective and education of what the issues are for online voting. And right now, our nation is thrown in so many different directions, it's hard to focus on what online voting could reasonably look like as soon as November. And in essence, many cybersecurity professionals, including myself, would say, well, it would be fantastic to be able to vote online with everything going on in the world. We're just not ready. Given that, you know, overlay and the various issues, do you think some states will still push forward with online voting for the federal presidential election? And if they do, do you think we're going to be able to wake up uh, the next morning to a result from the election? I think I'd be very surprised to see states offering online ballot return in a large fashion for the 2020 presidential election. I think with all of the conflict and controversy surrounding the Iowa caucus app, surrounding OmniBallot, there's just not enough to get us up to where we need to be in terms of trusting online elections. And we were talking a little bit earlier about how the idea that just one miscount can mean disaster and how there may be miscounts that already happen in terms of paper ballots. But when we look at switching so momentously to, to an online process, there's something that we really need to, as a country, be ready for and to respect the fact that, hey, we can trust this internet-based voting system. We're just not at that point yet. And again, if there's a lack of voter confidence, then it really undermines the entire operation. So to make this kind of momentous switch has to be a transition that is done with the right budget, with the right professionals, and with the right attitude. Basically, the opposite of what happened with the Iowa caucus app, where they only had two months, they didn't allow outside testing, and it just was not proactive enough to be ready. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for your time today. Any parting thoughts or final thoughts that you'd like to add? Definitely. And this conversation, I know we could go on for hours, days. There's so many layers to it. But basically, in essence, cybersecurity takes time and it takes diligence. And one of the real questions here is, in addition to potentially the online voting apps or programs having bugs or other vulnerabilities, 
election officials can't actually look at an individual voter's smartphone or computer and make sure there's no malware, there's no problem, there's encryption, everything is good. We can't do that because it goes against the idea in our elections of having the ability to vote anonymously. So I love this analogy I recently read in Politico, which is that allowing these electronic ballots to go through internet servers is like trusting FedEx to deliver a package that had to pass through warehouses with unlocked doors, open windows, and no security cameras. I think Politico's analogy there is really helpful because certainly there are ways that we could vote online right now with no problem, but it's not 100%. It's not there. And again, anything connected to the internet can be hacked. And until we have a system that has been tested, tested, and retested again, that has been put through pilot programs in many states and tried at different election levels, we can't be certain. So it's just not the right time. How can our listeners get in contact with you? I check my email and I can be reached at lisa at lisagarber.com. Listeners can also go to my website, lisagarber.com, to get all my latest articles, news appearances, and podcasts. And I'm happy to continue the discussion on this. It's something that's going to impact our nation for years to come. It's frustrating that we've been hit with this pandemic and all of these social issues at this time when it would be phenomenal to have a way to vote from home that we can trust, but it's just not there yet. Hopefully we'll see it in the future and it's gonna take time and money. Well, we really appreciate your time today and your thoughts on this matter. You've been listening to cybersecurity expert, Lisa Garber. Uh, So for Jen, Justin, and myself, thank you very much for listening. And we'll catch you on the next episode of the Digital Planning Podcast. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Digital Planning Podcast, the podcast designed to educate individuals about all things digital in connection with estate planning, business planning, and estate administration. Please subscribe to this podcast and leave us a rating or review on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you download your podcasts. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. This podcast is not intended nor should be relied upon as legal advice, nor is it creating any attorney-client relationship with a listener and the hosts or guests. The information provided is only for educational and informational purposes, and the information provided will likely change.